Okay, good evening, everyone. My name is Amanda. I'm the Events and Marketing Director for Bookworks, your longtime independent bookstore. We've been in Albuquerque's North Valley for 36 years. We just celebrated our 36th anniversary last month. Our owners have had the bookstore for 10 years, and this year's definitely been probably the most challenging of our 36. So we do encourage you to check out our website. Our website is bookworks without the O's. It's bkwrks.com. You can sh uh, shop there 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. We do need your orders right now. I'm going to be honest with you folks because I know a lot of you. I know a lot of you are book lovers. The last few weeks have been dreadfully slow. So I don't know if people are having pandemic fatigue or if they're just super turned in, tuned on to the news and doom scrolling on Facebook, but we really need some orders. So if there's anything that you want to order for Christmas, if you could do that now, we would so, so appreciate it. Um, again, I'm Amanda. If you're just joining us, I'm the Events and Marketing Director for Bookworks. This is my 57th virtual event of the pandemic from my lovely home office that has laundry right behind the sign. So we're super excited to be able to continue doing this, and we're very, very pleased that you joined us. We're also very excited to have with us a couple of authors that we've worked with uh, throughout the pandemic on events and before. Um, Lynn Miller, our friend from Bosque the Magazine, Albuquerque in print, and various other endeavors. She is here to celebrate the release of her new novel, Hugh Lynn. Yes, there's the cover. It's called The Unmasking. It's just out from the University of New Mexico Press. They also published her book, The Day After Death, which is also a novel, and Death of a Department Chair. Lynn is going to be in conversation with Hilda Roz tonight. Hilda was the longtime editor of Prairie Schooner, and she's an author herself of several collections, the most recent of which is List and Story. You can pick up both Lynn and Hilda's books, signed editions at Bookworks. I will put the link to Lynn's uh, event with the books there in the chat. And during the event, if you have any questions, you can also type those into the chat. We'll do a Q&A after the ladies go through their presentation and I'll be happy to moderate that. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to you two ladies, Lynn Miller and Hilda Raz. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you, Amanda, and thank you, Bookworks, as always. I don't know what we would do without Bookworks. So please support Bookworks, everyone. Um, welcome, I'm Lynn Miller. Thank you for coming to tonight's event, where my good friend Hilda Raz and I discuss and read from my new novel, The Unmasking. Hilda is a poet, an editor, a critic, and a nonfiction writer, and I am a fiction writer and playwright. We're both former professors and have worked together on many projects. Uh, we teach together frequently. We co-edit ABQ Imprint and other publications from Bosky Press, along with Linda Miller. We're excited to be here. So let's begin. I'll start with a brief summary of the novel. In an homage to the locked room mystery, the unmasking follows three friends who are professors, Miriam, Bettina, and Fiona, who suspect murder when their dean dies in a one-car accident after embezzling university funds. They travel to a resort in New Mexico where they join others in performing remarkable women from history, such as Gertrude Stein, Virginia Woolf, Mabel Dodge Lujan, Victoria Woodhull, and Edith Wharton. But when one woman is kidnapped and another disappears, the friends' lives are forever changed. They realize that the masks we wear often hide chilling truths. Thank you for that, Hilda. Let's begin by reading from early in the novel when we first meet Miriam and encounter her sense of unease. This passage also introduces her friendship with Bettina, who often adds humor to the proceedings. Miriam Held took a farewell turn along the boardwalk that traced the inlet before heading to her car. As she clutched the brim of her straw hat against a brisk Gulf Coast breeze, 
an armada of white riding the choppy waters arrested her. She gripped her binoculars. A squadron of white pelicans drifted in the current in front of the pier. Paired off two by two, their heads bobbed and dipped into the water, their feet trailing, their bodies curving toward one another. The supple necks angled toward the companion bird as if inviting the other to dance. And it was a dance, a sensuous orchestration of scoop beaks and weaving torsos as they fed, filtering the rippling water through the sane of their mouths. Necks bowing, bodies curving, they glided across the water's surface in a gastronomic minuet. Miriam held her breath, afraid any movement at all might disrupt the bird's ritual. The pod of pelicans coursed in time to an invisible score. Their streaming was too sinuous to be a march, even a majestic one. Brahms, Miriam wondered, or Schubert? She leaned against the railing, a tickle of desire rising in her throat at the sight of such synchrony and grace. Had she ever seen bodies more attuned? She thought not. As the last pair of birds floated away from her, Miriam turned to go. But in front of her, a ragged wing jutted up from the water. Then she noticed the bird's crooked neck drifting on the surface, its beak frozen, half open. A dead gull trailed the waltzing group, its feathers dirty and dull. Her spirits, Soaring a mere moment ago plummeted, and Miriam steadied herself on the handrail, imagining she saw a dark red stain in its wake. A spattering of cold rain seeping under her jacket collar sent her hurrying for the shelter of her car. Inside her Subaru outback, Miriam's cell rang. Yes, she said as her old friend Bettina Graf's number popped up. Where are you? Down at the coast in Port A. Remember the whales bubble netting in Alaska? I just saw something. A, a persistent whine emanated from her phone. Can't hear you very well, Bettina was saying. Just wanted to tell you the invitation came through. Invitation? For the festival in Silver City. Oh, Miriam felt flat-footed. But I must tell you about the pelicans. What? New Mexico. It's in New Mexico. I'm talking about pelicans in South Texas. P-E-L-I. I can't make you out. You're completely garbled. Miriam held the phone away from her ear. How could Patina hear nothing that she said when she could hear her friend perfectly? I'll call you when I get home. I was just going to hit the road now. Gnome? I'm not sure what you mean. Bettina's pleasant contralto rose in laughter. Tonight, call me tonight. Miriam ended the call and put the phone on the seat next to her. The dead bird unsettled her. It struck her as one sign of coming turbulence and her phone cutting out another. She remembered now that she'd agreed to speak at the gathering Bettina had mentioned and on a topic the locked room mystery that now also seemed alarming. Hey Lynn, you have a previous novel about this same group of academic friends, don't you? Death of a department chair? Yes, in that novel, Miriam is the chief, chief suspect in the murder of her department chair who had once been her lover. She investigates to find the actual perpetrator and saves her own life. This too recent death of a female colleague who had been attacked and left to die in her office still haunted Miriam. We'll continue on with her thoughts after the phone call with Bettina. While many people thought of the university as cushioned from reality, Miriam knew that academia was not a safe place. The gull's broken wing and twisted neck flashed again before her eyes. Since moving to Texas, Port Aransas has, had always been a place she'd come to restore her sense of peace. 
the small town accessed only by ferry, had an isolated charm. The dancing pelicans had taken her back to her innocence and hope and youth when she'd first come down to the Gulf Coast in the late 1980s. <clears throat> Today, the dead bird appeared as an ominous symbol. She placed a hand on her own neck. It felt fleshy and a tad solid as usual and very alive. But as she well knew, a person bursting with health one minute could be rendered lifeless the next. So Lynn, let's talk about the locked room mystery brought up in the summary we gave of the novel. What is the locked room mystery and how does it function in this novel? Characters all with motives, a secret affair, a lust for revenge of an old slight, a desire to inherit large sums, are confined together in a remote setting. One by one, each person is mysteriously killed. How was someone able to enter the space where the crime occurred, murder his or her victim, and exit without seemingly leaving a clue? From popular examples such as Agatha Christie's and Then There Were None, to the recent movie Knives Out, the formula of the locked room mystery has had staying power for decades for large audiences. There's usually only one way in and one way out of such rooms. So in the unmasking, what is the locked room? In the unmasking, the lodge itself functions as a series of locked rooms with mysterious accidents and events occurring and no one feeling that they can leave. There's a feeling of claustrophobia. Inside the lodge is a traditional locked room, a storage closet with no windows and only one door. But when it is open, something surprising is inside, as you'll see it in a few minutes. Another locked room is in essence the Dean's car where he dies. But how was his death orchestrated as he was alone and why? No one knows who and what caused his fatal accident until the pieces of the puzzle fall into place. Stay tuned. Miriam, in her keynote on the locked room mystery that she gives at the festival, puzzles through this crime that on the surface seemed like an accident, yet which was very carefully orchestrated. The crime was the death of Alec Martin, the dean. Let's hear the end of that passage. I ask you to contemplate a mind facile and arrogant enough to predict that an act of premeditated violence would appear 100 times out of 100 as just a bad break, casual, unfortunate, just one of life's little surprises, like a slip on a slick staircase or a skid in the shower or a burst vessel in the brain. It was something that could happen to anyone at any time. But Alec's death would not have happened at any time, just at one. On a Friday morning at rush hour, in the one mile drive from the victim's home to his neighborhood grocery. Call it designer's delight. Call it devil's play. Call it the perfect crime. We found out in the prior book that Miriam is a student of Sherlock Holmes, and we can see this in her lecture on the locked room. Yes, she is fascinated by the perfect crime, which produces many clues, but goes undetected until someone, a very brilliant someone usually, puts the pieces together. Alec, the dean, seems to be in a lot of trouble, and then he's the victim in this book. He dies in Austin. But now the friends are in a hotel in the mountains in New Mexico called Oso Grande, Big Bear. And you call the Festival of Performances a Chautauqua. What's a Chautauqua? Originally, over 100 years ago, Chautauqua was a movement that brought culture to small towns in America with lectures by famous people like William Jennings Bryant. Theodore Roosevelt once called it the most American thing in America. Now, scholar performers in costume impersonate famous people presenting first a monologue as that person, and then they answer questions as that character. 
the Chautauqua is itself a kind of unmasking because the performer after the monologue as the historical figure traditionally takes off an article of clothing. For instance, a tie or a brooch or a hat to once again become themselves, the actor to answer questions in the present from the audience. Hey Lynn, aren't the Chautauqua performances another kind of locked room, sort of like a play within a play? I like to think that each of the Chautauqua performance, performances are like a door being opened. You get to turn a key and be in another world where different rules apply. And clues emerge of who is really underneath the costume and what their motives really are. The unmasking is very much about women's lives and women's rights. Isn't Victoria Woodhull one of the women from history performed? Who is she? Victoria was the first woman in the U.S. to run for president at the head of a major party, which was called the Equal Rights Party. This was in 1872. Wow. We are now celebrating the 100th anniversary of women's rights to vote in this country. Is this one of the reasons that you were happy that the book is coming out in 2020? Yes. The focus on women's history this year of the centenary makes the women's festival in the novel especially timely, particularly with the inclusion of Victoria Woodhull, who was so ahead of her time and not well known to readers today. For instance, most people don't know that Woodhull was the first woman to address the US Congress, not Elizabeth Cady Stanton or Susan B. Anthony, who are better known. I didn't know that. I'm glad to know it now. <laughs> Also, I have to say, women's lives are presented in other ways, too, in the unmasking. For example, in Fiona's performance of Edith Wharton, she says, Wharton was not the kind of political pioneer that Victoria Woodhull had been, yet she wrote again and again of the social strictures that strangled women's lives and potential. Continuing a little later in that passage, as she listened, Bettina's mind seized upon what now seemed an old idea of women as commodities. Had Alec collected his wife, Barbara, because of her beauty and accomplishment? Edith, Edith Wharton had never wanted to be commodified. No wonder Wharton had been captivated by the joke about Edith Wharton and Teddy Roosevelt as self-made men. I'm quoting again from the book. This phrase became a drumbeat in Bettina's mind as she attended to Fiona's pleasant alto voice. It reverberated with the very project they were all in Silver City to do, and that was to construct an identity beyond their own persona. How many women had craved or emulated the veneer of maleness? The Me Too movement today continues the discussion about gender and power. And right now we have the chance to elect our first female vice president. Yes. Hey, Lynn, let's turn back to the mystery plot. The dead Dean's wife, Barbara, is part of the festival in Silver City, New Mexico, too. She immediately becomes a target of suspicion, partly because she's inherited three million dollars from Alex Insurance. It turns out that the festival's moderated, moderator, who plays the American writer Gertrude Stein, is Barbara's new lover. After Barbara has disappeared, Bettina, Miriam, and Vivian, Miriam's wife, gather for dinner. The locked room mystery Vivian offers I suppose that's just a metaphor for closed communities of every kind. Families, work environments, anywhere people are thrown together for any period of time. If people are stuck together, resentments can percolate. It's really a miracle more people don't do away with each other when you think about it. Bettina nods. Fortunately, most folks worry about getting caught. That holds down the acting out of some of the rage and ill will. A thought occurred to Miriam. What if each of us lives in a locked room? I mean, isn't that what our biased, 
perception really is. Over time, each of us develops patterns of thinking and feeling. We learn to filter things in predictable ways. If we don't make an effort, we get locked into reacting by rote, responding to some stimuli and ignoring others. We don't let in new ideas or experiences. You know, I keep thinking of Stein's only mystery, blood on the dining room floor, Bettina says. All those coincidences, deaths, things not working. Maybe that was true of Alec. He'd made a lot of mistakes, publicly wailed on people, had misappropriated funds, all of it. But what if none of that added up to why he died? I haven't wanted to admit this is possible, but what if the simple explanation is the right one? He crashed his car into a post. It could happen to anyone. Well, yes, it could, Miriam concedes. But when someone has the air of desperation about him as he did, and for it to happen on the day of his annual gala, well, it seems like blood on the dining room floor. And now there's his wife. Barbara seems entirely too organized to simply disappear. I can't help but think there's a plan behind this. Miriam sat back in her chair and contemplated the cold food left on the table. The carrots and potatoes had a greasy sheen on them, leavings clinging like thin tendons. Had that really been a roast beef before they'd fallen on it, and prior to that, a breathing creature walking in the earth? Decline and death were not pretty things to look at. Hey, Lynn. What were you thinking of when you wrote that part? One of my ideas in this book is to investigate the conventions of the mystery form itself. The isolated setting, the possible suspects, their public selves hiding their private motives. Part of the unmasking is the mystery of human personality. And then in the book, we have both the amateur sleuths, who are professors out of their depth, and the professional ones who happen to be detectives. One of the conventions of this kind of mystery is that there are amateur sleuths like Miriam and Bettina, and then there are the professional detectives. In this novel, there is Lieutenant Susan Crane, who also worked with Miriam in Death of a Department Chair. Let's end with an excerpt from a scene where Miriam and the investigating officer, Lieutenant Crane, enter the locked storage room, hoping to find the missing Barbara. They glided into the entry through the great room, which held only a large round table for the final festival participants dinner that evening and into the small dining area by the kitchen. In that space, even the art on the hand plastered walls, usually so bold in its design throughout the lodge, appeared tentative and hushed, as if waiting for something or someone. A simple pencil drawing of a horse alone in a field, a watercolor of a stream making its way alongside a road. Liminal zones, thought Miriam, places where people were not here or there, but on the way to becoming. Lieutenant Crane put her ear to the door of the storage room. Silence. She whispered. She waved Miriam forward. As Miriam laid a hand against the cool wooden door and listened, she too could hear nothing stirring inside. Slowly, Crane extended her hand and cradled it around the doorknob. Her face creased in strain. Impatiently, she brushed strands of hair off her forehead with the other hand, then tensed her arm and turned the knob. The door swung open. The storage room loomed in front of them like a black pit. If quiet could make a sound, the room em echoed with emptiness. The detective moved ahead. Behind her, Miriam was startled to see a gun in Susan Crane's hand leveled into the center of the room. The detective slapped the wall with her other hand and flipped the light switch. A fluorescent light in the ceiling cast its unrelenting glare on the table and shelves. Canned goods and old appliances, 
a small fan with a bent blade, a toaster, a tiny microwave lined the shelves. The table was dust free and empty. Nothing was on the scuffed wooden floor but an old pair of boots neatly lined up to the kickboards to the right of the door. Look! Miriam pointed at the coat rack. Barbara's Mabel Dodge Luhan costume hung from one curved arm, limp, its black seed pearls glimmering in the harsh light. The two women edged forward. Pinned to the right shoulder of the gown was a white note with a single word typed upon it. Goodbye. What a place to stop. Well, from this point, we start building toward the end of the book, so we can't reveal any of that. At one point in the novel, Miriam says that perhaps we all get the locked room that we deserve. A scary thought, Lynn. On this note, I think we better open up for questions. Right. We've got a few coming in. That was just intriguing. I can't wait to see where that goes. <laughs> Email from Alice Brassfield. She wants to know how you find your characters. Oh, okay. Um, they just kind of show up. And uh, these, these three main characters in this book, and then there are several others also that have been in a couple of other novels, um, descended upon me when I was working still at the University of Texas at Austin. And uh, I think of them as my renegade professors. And I think they kept my uh, mind <laughs> occupied in lighter ways while I was finishing my uh, time at UT. Um, but in other writing, I don't know, I would, just, I would have to say that I either get a character first or I get a title first. And um, so, you know, it's, it's like you open a door and they're sh standing there. Hello, they say. <laughs> All righty, let's see. Claire Van Ends, she wants to know, she says, it's now the future, 2120, which three historical characters from the 2000 forward would you have your characters perform and why these choices? Oh, now, uh, I wonder if she means from 2000 or before 2000. Let's from 2000. From 2000 forward, and she's, okay. she's so just the last 20 years. 2120 is the, the time she's giving you. Interesting. Okay, she's only giving me 20 years. Oh, I think she wants something else. She's got a. <laughs> is she writing? <laughs> Let me unmute Claire. Well, maybe she means 100 years. Claire, I'm going 100. to to unmute so that you can ask your question. Yes, I meant 100 years. Oh, good. I'm thinking 20 <laughs> years. Wow. <laughs> okay. Numbers. Um, <laughs> let's see. Well, someone um, that I've always wanted to perform is Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who was one of the organizers of the uh, Seneca, Seneca Falls Convention. Um, and I did perform a few of her speeches, but I never got around to doing uh, the research. So I think, I think she's kind of a perennially fascinating character um, who also raised seven children, went to law school when she couldn't get in and uh, did all kinds of things. Um, so she's, she's definitely one. Um, let's see, I think, um, I think someone who will be performed and will has been performed a lot is Hillary Clinton. And there's already some plays about her. Um, and, uh, you know, she seems like the kind of person who will live a long time. And I anticipate that there will be all kinds of different things uh, done about her. Um, gosh, there's so many people that we would like to talk with, aren't there? Uh, who else? Well, I've always thought it would be just marvelous to have Edgar Allan Poe around. And um, who knows, maybe spin a few stories with him. And in Chautauqua, I don't think gender should be 
an issue. I think that you should be able to perform anybody you want. Do they let you do that in life? What, Amanda? Are they pretty flexible about that or are they kind well, of- Well, actually, no. I mean, when you, when you do these Chautauqua tours, they're kind of traditional uh -huh. and they don't, like, they don't like that. But I like that. <laughs> it would make them more interesting. Yeah, I think so. Mm -hmm. The characters are, are linked to the place where Chautauqua is being performed. So, but you right. can always risk it. Yeah. I know. Here's one from Laura Furman. She wants to know what kind of mysteries you enjoy reading and who are some of your favorite authors? Well, lately I've been binging on Scandinavian noir, uh, which is kind of a perennial favorite. And um, there's actually an American writer now writing Scandinavian noir named Derek Miller, no relation. And so I've been reading him lately. He's fun. And then I've discovered a new Swedish uh, writer named Camilla Grebe and uh, enjoy her. I like Karen Fossum from Norway. Um, other mystery writers, gosh, I read so many mystery writers. <laughs> um, I kind of like some of the old classic ones like Dorothy Sayers and Nao Marsh um, and of course Agatha Christie. I mean this book in some ways is a send-up of an Agatha Christie uh, which was a lot of fun but um, anyway I'm open to many suggestions. In fact Laura Furman I get many from you. <laughs> Linda wants to know how you came to write a mystery that includes Chautauqua elements. Okay, you all would too. So you're on a tour doing Chautauqua for a week or two weeks with a group of people and you're thrown together with them all the time. You know, they're performing somebody, you're performing somebody. And there's all kinds of gossip, sometimes infighting, sometimes some really wacky things go on. And so one time I was just sitting somewhere with these people thinking this is a perfect place for a murder to take place <laughs> so that's where the idea came from not that there was anyone i wanted to murder you understand <laughs> that might be a little too much excitement for the chautauqua <laughs> all right here's one from deb green our bookseller also a writer herself she wants to know if you titled the book before the pandemic. I was curious about that too, because wow, how much more timely could you get with this metaphor and title? Well, I know, and I actually did title it several years ago um, before the pandemic. And um, then, then the book came out this year in the middle of the pandemic. And it's like, how interesting, but it was a total accident. Serendipity. Yeah. Okay, I think this is Menrose Gwen. Uh, Lynn, I love the first sentence of your novel, I Am No Longer Young. How did you arrive at a first line like that? Was it <laughs> early or late in the writing process? Uh, that was very early in the writing process, and I have to say that it was very autobiographical <laughs> in that uh, one day I was teaching and I uh, made some kind of joke and uh, most people didn't get my joke. And I remember thinking, wow, how long have I been doing this? <laughs> and I just had that thought, I am no longer young, I guess. <laughs> so that's where that one came from. I think we've all had that thought. <laughs> okay, here's one from Elizabeth McKetta. She says, place is so alive and important in your books, including a sort of Austin that no longer exists. Any advice for writers writing about place? Well, I think place is um, a writer's gift, really. Um, and sometimes when you get stuck in other parts of the book, if you have some kind of a dynamic setting, you can just go off and, you know, describe the setting, imagine how your characters would be in that setting, um, imagine strange things that could happen in that setting. So I think that um, that my advice for writers about setting is to choose one that is somehow metaphoric of the story that you want to tell. Um, 
I know in my last novel, The Day After Death, uh, it was really important that there be a lot of um, cold and winter. And so part of that book took place in the upper Midwest in North Dakota, where I'm from. Uh, but I just felt that that was where the book was percolating in that. And then the book switched to Austin, which was intensely hot. So I love those two poles. Uh, so I, I think, just think of setting as a character. Setting is really um, a dynamic part of, of any story. Okay, here's one from Francois. Lynn, I'm glad to be your friend, but as a current department chair and former dean, you are making me nervous. What is with killing off these academics? And tell me how you really feel about academia. <laughs> well, I left academia, so now I can kill them all off, you know. <laughs> well, it's actually done with great um, affection. But uh, yeah. I remember once um, when Death of a Department Chair came out, I was supposed to go to um, an unnamed California university and they had to, to cancel me because the department chair was so unpopular at that moment that they thought he would freak out if he saw a poster saying Death of a Department Chair. So people do take these things very seriously. But Francois, you know, you're just not the kind of academic that we're worried about. <laughs> You're going to do okay. <laughs> oh. Okay, here's one from Ruth Redner. She says, with so many characters and so many of them playing other characters, did you ever mix up any of them? Did I mix them up? Um, well, certainly in typos. I mean, I did, I did um, kind of do that, but uh, no, because... Um, Something weird that you do with Chautauqua is that you start thinking of the character as yours. So if someone is performing someone, then you have a double character in this book anyway. So, um, you know, it's like Bettina was always agonizing about her performance of Virginia Woolf. And so I thought of the two of them together. So I couldn't really imagine anyone else performing Woolf in this, this novel. Um, now I'm hoping that the reader does not get confused. That's the important thing. Um, I guess I'll find out. People will complain if they do. Okay, here's one from Laura. I think she's, I think the question is, do you agree that Wilkie Collins invented the first mystery novel? Well, Wilkie Collins, The Woman in White, if you haven't read it, is a great mystery to this day. And I think it may have been one of the more popular early ones, but I always thought that the Gothic novel started with the Castle of Otranto, which I think was earlier. I think it was maybe, um, I don't know how many years earlier, but anyway, Wilkie Collins certainly popularized the mystery. And uh, he was a really great friend of Charles Dickens. And um, so that puts him, you know, firmly Victorian, maybe a little earlier even. Um, but I love his books. Great stuff. Okay. And, uh, maybe, maybe he is more of the father of the psychological mystery than, than earlier ones I can think of. Good thought. <clears throat> All right, Cindy Sylvester, what is it like to stay with the same characters over time? Well, I've told Hilda that I have to cut these three women off, that I just can't write any more books about them. <laughs> no, they change. Their but lives they're, yeah. Yeah, they're aging. They're aging a little bit, so they're changing. They're it's actually, and shedding them, and yes. That's true. That's true. Um, it's actually really fun to be able to continue on with a group of people. Um, I can see why... Um, some writers end up writing, you know, 15 books about people. Uh, I wouldn't go that far, but, but it, is, it is kind of fun to feel like you're tied into their lives and you want to see what they're going to do next and what's going to happen to them next. And, um, and then you, you're not limited to one novel. You can, you know, go further. It's like, it's like a long mini series. And they you know, also collaborate. So yeah. it's only that each has a, an ongoing life but they collaborate in 
academia as well as mystery. Yeah. Well, I, I, I am interested in how women friendship, women's friendships work, and, and they have really been um, interesting that way, how their friendships have developed. <clears throat> Do you want to tell us a little bit more about the cover and the significance of the black bird? Oh my gosh. <laughs> um, this cover was such a surprise to me because, you know, the, uh, publishers pop covers at you and say, what do you think? And um, I had never anticipated this cover, but then I fell in love with it because of the crow being unmasked um, and turning into the bear and the, the lodge is Oso Grande. So um, I was totally intrigued by the cover, but I had a different cover in mind, but um, I think, I think it's much more interesting than the cover I had in mind, actually. It's very metaphoric. And lots of people think it's something else. I mean, I've had many people um, say it's a different animal than it is. But maybe it is that animal. But anyway, um, I like the starkness of it. You know, it's like anything can happen. And then, of course, I'm such a Poe fan, so I love that bird. <clears throat> Well, this has been such fun. So uh, I thank you all very, very much for coming. And um, thank you, thank you. And thank you, Hilda, for being such a wonderful collaborator on this evening. Thank you. And thank you, Amanda. Thank you. We were pleased to do it. If you'd like to unmute yourselves, you're welcome to applaud for our author. We all want to congratulate Lynn Miller. On what wonderful faces. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and there's Tilly. <laughs> oh, yay, Tilly. <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. Congratulations, Lynn. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. That was great, Lynn. Good to see you all. Loved it. Can't wait to read it. Yes, looking forward. Yes. Good. Yes, do do read it. I'm in the middle. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Look at bkwrks.com. We have six more events this month. We've got some great ones lined up next week, including Pam Houston and Amy Irvine talking about their new book. Mm -hmm. It's called Air Mail. It's letters that they wrote to each other during the pandemic on politics. It's gonna be awesome. Um, what else do we have coming up? We've got In Scott Mama Day next month. If you buy that book, you can come to the event. It's a collection of nature essays called Earth Keeper. And then one more event I'll mention on October 28th. We're hosting several Southwestern poets that are found in a new um, Norton anthology of Native American poetry. It's an amazing anthology, just a huge mm -hmm. breadth of Native poets. We're going to be hosting Tacey Atsidi. Sherwin Bitsui, Cassandra Lopez, uh, Tommy Pico as part of that event. That's mm. on October 20th. Yeah. So I'm on our website, <laughs> register events on the website now and I'll send you a reminder. And we look forward to seeing you all again soon. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Bye, Hilda.